Hey everybody, welcome, welcome. We got a fantastic webinar today. We're gonna make everybody a few minutes just to trickle in, say hello. Uh, last time we had an awesome webinar with Brad Lancaster about water harvesting, but this time, oh, we're gonna blow everybody's minds with the topic about the science of generating rainfall. But before we do any introductions, we want to know where everybody's coming in from. We'll, uh, we'll launch a poll later during the webinar, but uh, please introduce yourself. There's a chat box below that you can say where you're coming in from. My name is Raleigh Latham. I'm coming in from Costa Rica right now. We have Zach Weiss, Carl Strzok, and Cindy Morris joining us, but you know, usually it's people coming from all over the place. Yeah, just like just what I suspected. Zach's from Montana, Tony's from Cyprus, Marion from Phoenix, Jeremy from New Mexico, Melissa from Oaxaca, Amy from Spain, Gerard from Argentina, Elizabeth from Kansas, Matthias from Deutschland, uh, Christine from Florida, or, or from Thailand. Yeah, France, Canada, California, New Mexico, Seattle, Canada, Chile. It, this is totally, people are, are coming in from everywhere. And what's blowing my mind is this is a science webinar, and this is, this is the largest amount of people interested in a webinar we've ever had I mean, you know almost almost 1200 people are joining us for a science webinar and this is a really exciting prospect because this means people must be interested in the science of ecosystem restoration so this is i'm i'm really grateful to have all these people joining us from all over the world yeah too many names to count angela from australia john from ontario Lori from portland um, Renee, hydro, hydroecologist from India. Ah, this is great. It's, it's good to have every continent represented here. Now I know if some of the folks might not be joining us from Australia because it's just you know so late there, but we'll be sending the replay out. All right, hello from Oakland. Good to see you again. All right, everybody. Well, we're gonna get started uh, very soon. My name is Rala Latham, joined again by Zach Weiss of Water Stories. And today, the topic is called Biology Makes of the Rain, the Science of Restoring Rainfall. And this is going to be very exciting because it's a deep dive uh, science webinar. And uh, so you're going to be seeing the topic and being introduced to the topic. If you're not familiar with the biotic pump, if you're not familiar with how trees help seed rainfall, this is going to really be exciting because you're going to see the topic of how we how nature helps restore itself and how nature helps create rainfall. So Zach, why don't you uh, give everybody an introduction and then Carl will, will introduce Cindy and we'll get started. Yeah, really excited. Thank you, Cindy, for coming on and uh, helping people understand this vital topic. And thank you, Carl, for making the connection and really opening up this to the greater community. Um, really excited to have Cindy Morris here. She's a senior scientist at France's National Institute for Agriculture, Food, and the Environment. Uh, she's got a lot of wonderful experience. She had her sabbatical at the same university that I went as an undergrad. Um, and this connection was made by Carl Strzok, who I'll let introduce Cindy a bit more. Um, and Carl has a really interesting background for over 30 years. He's been stewarding a 40 acre ponderosa pine forest in northern New Mexico, evolving his management practices in the last 15 years to engage the five principles of regenerative agriculture in support of soil, forest, soil health, and the water cycle. Uh, so we have a really awesome collaboration here between someone who's done it, been observing it, been working with systems for a long time, and then someone who's really steeped in the science of all of this and has a rich and long history at something that's really foundational to the story that we share at Water Stories. Uh, so Carl, if you'd like to take from here, kind of explain how, how this webinar came about and then we'll let Cindy take it away. Sure. Uh, yeah, in the last um, 10 years or so, I've, I've sort of been getting in touch with my inner scientist that I didn't know really existed. Um, and, and we have, we live very remotely here in the mountains but we have fiber optics right to the house. So I can get on the internet, great connection. So I can really dive deeply into soil science and, and the water cycle. And in the process of doing that uh, late November, I, I came across a 10 minute video um, by someone named Cindy Morris 
that really unpack very succinctly, very clearly, the uh, biotic pump. And this was, okay, a little bit of a newsflash for me. It, it was like, okay, maybe it was existing in the back of my mind, but it really brought it up front and center to me. And I thought, you know, if I haven't really internalized this information, maybe other people haven't either. And the month of December, I just thought, I should write something to bring people's eyes to this issue uh, from a scientific um, st standpoint. So I ended up writing a little article with a link to Cindy and some other, um, some other research on the topic. And uh, then I thought, I need to write an email because I, I found an email on her, on her website, just thanking her for putting together that beautiful, clear um, a description of how this all works. And I did, and she answered back, and we had a nice little exchange with we both written songs about trees, and we exchanged our links to our songs. So that was really fun, and that started a, a dialogue, and she very generously offered to do a webinar if I knew some platform that would be, you know, uh, appropriate. And I thought of Water Stories, so I contacted Zach, and here we are. Serendipitous. It's wonderful how that, that worked so quickly. So welcome to everyone around the world. This is really exciting. Okay, so we take it from there. Take it on, Cindy. So should I go ahead and start right. and share my PowerPoint presentation? So yeah, go for it. While I'm screening up here, just have everybody uh, hang on to your chairs because we're going to go back to school. Okay, and um, that's great. And just a FYI for everybody that this is going to be recorded and everybody will get message afterwards about the replay. So no need to worry. Like if you can't make 10 minutes or 20 minutes, you'll get a replay. Okay. So here we go. So um, I'm going to try to be as clear as I can, although I am going to be talking about some things that are complex scientifically. And I entitled my talk, Flying Microbes, Atmospheric Highways and the Role of Biology and Rainfall. So before I start, I want to just give you a little short presentation about where I'm coming from so that you understand. So I grew up in Michigan on the shores of beautiful, beautiful Lake Michigan, but in between two power plants. So that really kind of <laughs> nuclear power plants. So it sort of colored my, my childhood. I went to, I was an undergraduate at Michigan State University where I studied natural sciences, but also a history and philosophy of science. So that made me really ask questions about how things worked and how science advances. Then I went for a PhD in the Department of Plant Pathology at Wisconsin, where I studied diseases caused by bacteria on leaves. But it just so happened that that bacterium was the one Pseudomonas syringae that was also discovered to have this isonucleation active property. And that's really where I learned about bacteria that could eventually be implicated in, in rainfall, but no one had looked at it from that perspective really at the time. Then I went for a postdoctoral research experience in, in China for four years where I was able to look at frost damage, which was one aspect of how these bacteria work. And then now since 1989, I've been a research scientist um, in uh, in RIA, we call it now, it changed its names recently. So I'm at the end of my career. Um, but the, the, it allows me to have traveled a, a, a various different um, pathways. So I'm going to divide my talk up into questions or uh, sequences where I'm hoping to answer simple questions and then we can move on to the next one. So this part is about uh, vegetation, the water cycle, and what on climate processes, okay, the climate nexus, and who are the players and the processes that you need to understand to be able to reason about um, this, the water cycle. So as you all know, vegetation affects the water cycle, affects water, climate at local, regional, and continental continental scales. So again, you can you probably can find these publications because all most of them are open access. Uh, we have a very interesting publication that came out that uh, talked about the seven different ways that plants and especially forests impact uh, water and climate. And the reason we wrote this paper was we said, you know, everybody's planting trees to sequester CO2, but that's not all there is. And that they could be planted in a much more intelligent way if there were also incitations to push these different um, ways that they influence. So this paper uh, talks about those seven different ways uh, very importantly. So I'm going to focus on the ones involving precipitation. Aujourd'hui, 
today. Excuse me, I spoke French. <laughs> so my my thing doesn't want to advance. Excuse me. Okay. So um, the impacts that vegetation has on the atmosphere is really a consequence of this feedback, feedback of multiple traits. There's an energy exchange and mass exchange between a surface of land covered with plants or not covered with plants and the atmosphere. So the energy exchange involves light, uh, sunlight and all the different forms of it that are reflected back. And mass exchange involves gases and particles, all right? But, and then they have different impacts on the atmosphere that could be changing its relative humidity, influencing air temperature, the wind, which I'll talk about later, and precipitation. So we're going to focus on just this, the precipitation. But again, I've listed all the all the um, references where you can read in detail if you want to um, about these interactions. So first question, what makes rain? Okay, so if we're going to talk about how biology can affect rain, uh, we want to know how it's made. And um, this part concerns aerosols and the physics of water. All right, so first thing, any rainmaking that anyone wants to do has to be done in the context of these, what we call the synoptic conditions without the large scale atmospheric circulation needed to bring vapor and move vapor and create the conditions for rain. You can do whatever you want, you won't have rain. So this is the stage, this large scale atmospheric circulation sets the stage for rain. And aerosols, are what can be an added value. Okay, I'm just gonna move this bar because it keeps preventing me from seeing what I'm talking about. Aerosols, they act as a catalyst to facilitate the processes, the physical processes that lead to rain. And these processes involve the phase changes of water. So these aerosol particles can play a role in phase changes of water. Uh, Cindy, sorry to yes. interrupt you. It's some, some folks are saying that they can't see the slides. Uh, Zach, oh. and can, can, every, can everyone see the slides or is that an issue here? Okay. Yeah, Cindy, I think if you could stop share and reshare. Um, I'm seeing okay. them, but it's caught on a previous oh, okay. one. And I think. All right. A lot no, of I mean, are... we go back. Yeah, we go back. All right. I can't see them. I can see them. I see the slides. I see. I can see. Lots of people can see them. Yeah, it's, but it's, I'll do it again. It's interesting. Yeah, we'll just pop All it right. up and hopefully that'll help. Okay, so we'll start again. No problem. No problem. So. And I... she was on the first slide, everybody. She, she didn't. Okay. So I'm back here at the. Uh... Uh, so I didn't see since the vegetation effects. So maybe we could um, even two slides before that. Okay, yeah, so that's way at the beginning. Too. Okay, so um, yeah, that's the last slide I saw. Vegetation yeah. effects, and then you saw this one. Uh, uh, no, no I, I didn't see that either. Okay, so these are these are the effects, the consequences of feedbacks between vegetation and the atmosphere. So right now I'm not in the slot in the sharing mode, but that perhaps it's better to not um, be in the it's, PowerPoint. It's working. Mode. I I think you could try the PowerPoint mode again if okay. you want, but this is yeah, also we can try it. Okay, because Everybody's... sometimes what happens is that it does cause a delay, okay? Yeah. So I was there, let's see, I was here, right? Okay, so yep. you, have the, you have the vegetation, atmospheric interactions with energy and mass, all right? And then the next part I, was, I transitioned to is what makes rain. So we'll talk about great the basic now. problem. It's okay now? Yep, looks like everybody's, okay. everybody can see it. Okay. So I said, you need to have the synoptic conditions. If you don't have these large uh, synoptic conditions, this is what you see on weather maps, okay? You, you're not gonna get rain, whatever you do, okay? So you need that. And then in addition to that, sometimes you need catalysts to make it happen. And that's what aerosols do. So aerosols are those little part of particulate matters in the atmosphere. And these aerosols, they um, catalyze phase changes of water that would not happen, that would eventually happen, but they'd happen too slow because the synoptic conditions would have changed. All right. So we're going to just remind you about the basic phases of water. Okay. 
gas, liquid, and solid. Ask yourself, I will answer the question, what phase is a cloud? Most of you will, will say one thing, but it's not true. And so these arrows, the red arrows, are where you need to add energy to make the phase change. The blue arrows are where you need to remove to cool to make the phase change. All right. And so gas is what we, we sense as relative humidity or vapor in the air. Clouds are liquid, condensed gas. They're not vapor. And then solid, of course, is ice and snow. All right. Clouds and rain. Ice and snow are, are solid. All right. And so there's, we're going to talk about two types of aerosols. One that catalyzes the step of condensation, so gas going to liquid, and one that catalyzes the step of liquid moving to solid, so freezing. Those things are not spont spontaneous under all conditions. So just a reminder again, so the catalysts that help vapor condensed to make liquid are called cloud condensation nuclei. And that's what allows the formation of droplets, tiny little beads of water. And that's what assembles to make clouds. So clouds, some people call them unusual aerosols because they're the, the condensed water, but all aggregated together, right? And then for the liquid water in the clouds to freeze, which is a process that is necessary to make rain, there are catalysts called ice nucleation active particles that catalyze freezing. And they this allows a couple of drops in the clouds to freeze, and then other drops in the cloud that are below zero degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit can attach to those frozen drops to cause the droplets to form into big drops, which are heavy enough to fall. So ask yourself the question, why doesn't a cloud fall on your head if it's water? And because the droplets are too small to fall. So for rain to form, you need some process of bringing the little droplets together in a big drop that is heavy enough to then fall. And in temperate zones where most of us live, but not everybody, you need freezing. Now in tropical zones, you can have a uh, heavy, heavy turbulence, will, which will make droplets bang into each other, these tropical storms, you don't necessarily need freezing. But in temperate regions, you need this very often to get precipitation to fall, all right? So why does freezing these catalysts? Doesn't water freeze at zero degrees, okay, or 32 degrees Fahrenheit? I'm sure there's a half a dozen of you in there, in the audience, asking this question. So let's answer it, all right? So first of all, I want to just, uh, okay, so the, what the role of these catalysts is to help orient the, the water molecules into a hexagonal matrix. So when we draw water, we represent it like this on the left. We have hydrogen, two hydrogen molecules, and an oxygen molecule. So we're going to show you some figures where we use this representation. And keep in mind that the oxygen has a negative charge and the hydrogen has a positive charge. So this is a simulation that a scientist made where they kind of drew, depicted what mo water molecules would look like as they're moving around to form ice. And this, the, the yellow numbers are nanoseconds because it happens really fast. And what happens is you get suddenly in this movement of molecules, you can get the formation of an ice embryo, something that is nearly the form of ice with enough water molecules to then hold on to the other water molecules to bring them into a crystal if the temperature is right, All right? So that's what happens. That's how ice forms. You need to set off that process. So um, the growth of an ice crystal depends on forming this ice embryo. And this embryo has to be stable at the given ambient temperature. So if you let this happen by itself naturally, just naturally, at minus five degrees Celsius, all right? Go minus five degrees Celsius, which I, I can't translate in, into Fahrenheit anymore, but it maybe it's about uh, 25 degrees Fahrenheit. You would need 45,000 water molecules to at random on their own, organize themselves 
be organized into a crystal that could hold the rest of the molecules. The probability of that is, is very, very small, especially within a small period of time. Keep in mind that a cloud, the life of a cloud is maybe only 15 minutes and then it disperses and it makes another cloud. So the probability of that happening just by random movement of molecules is very small. Whereas at minus 40 degrees Celsius, which is also minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit, that's where the two scales meet, you only need 70 molecules and that's highly probable. So that's why the spontaneous freezing of water is not zero degrees, it's minus 40 degrees Celsius spontaneous freezing. Water has a tendency then to be super cooled, to stay, that means stay liquid at temperatures colder than zero degrees or colder than 32 degrees Fahrenheit, because it just can't get itself organized to freeze, right, fast enough. And so this is just a repeat of what I said, okay, that the orientation of 70 molecules into an ice embryo by random movement is likely in a short time. And that means that the spontaneous freezing temperature of pure water is about minus 40 degrees. It's minus 39 if you have any physicists in the audience. Whereas the orientation of a much larger number of molecules is just improbable in a rapid period of time. And that's why you require a catalyst. Okay, so this is why this is important. And so that catalyst is called an ice nucleus or ice nuclei, right? These catalysts. So can biology influence the processes that lead to rain? That's the question that you brought me here to talk about, right? <laughs> so the answer is yes, right? And it does it mostly via plants and via management practices of crops and forests because they can be sources of one, atmospheric water vapor, and two, aerosols that can act as cloud condensation nuclei and ice nuclei. So, I mean, I'm sure you all know about the atmospheric water vapor, okay? It comes from plants, soil, and inland bodies of water over terrestrial regions, and we call that evapotranspiration. Okay, there are plants that pump out more water than others. Okay, and then it also comes from atmospheric rivers. So atmospheric rivers on the right are, an, are a narrow corridor of concentrated moisture that comes off the ocean and often then lands on a, a, a landmass. And so the most notable ones are in California, where we're hearing about floods and droughts, droughts because the atmospheric river didn't come and floods because the atmospheric river just comes and it's too, it's excessive, right? It doesn't always need to be that way, but that's what's happening now. So those are the two sources of atmospheric water over the land, over continents, all right? And then where do the aerosols come from? So cloud condensation nuclei, um, many of them come from um, they're volatile organic compounds that are emitted from plants as gases, and then these gases will condense in the atmosphere and they make solid particles. Um, and often you see this over a forest, certain kind of trees, you have a haze, right? Because it's the interaction of those particles with helping the water condense, so they make kind of, they make clouds, right? You have ice nucleation active particles, some of which come from the microorganisms that are on plants. So this picture is a picture of rust spores. So a, a disease of the, the crop that are being liberated as the tractor goes through the um, farmland. And these rust spores are, can, well, we measured that they are ice nucleation active. So they can act as catal catalyst to make ice from, make solid water from, from liquid water. Um, and so the sources of microorganisms that can be ice nucleation active particles, um, the, almost universally the ones that are known that are abundant come from plants and leaf litter. So there are bacteria, the most famous one is Pseudomonas syringae, there are fungi, um, and then from soil and litter there are also other types of bacteria, fungi, and algae that can do this. But the one that gives you your biggest bang for your buck is Pseudomonas syringae, all right? So that's, that's the role. Those are the types of things that can be generated. But interestingly, 
burning of plant materials, wildfires releases, creates and releases ice nucleation active particles. So Carl, you're gonna start thinking about the answer to your question. We'll talk about it at the end of the, of the talk, but burning of plant materials definitely releases ice nucleation active particles. We're not actually sure what they're composed of, but it's something that is created by, by the fire. This is a new field of study called pyroaerobiology. So we're just gonna show you in action, I hope this video works, um, the isonucleation activity of the bacterium Pseudomonas syringae. So this is a tube of uh, distilled water, sterilized distilled water in the lab. And we've cooled this water down to minus seven degrees Celsius. So it's super cold, it's still liquid. If you go to my blog and you see the video, you can see that there's an incubator there where you can see the temperature on it. Here, you're just gonna have to believe me. And in the little uh, pipette tip, the yellow tip, there's a suspension of this bacterium Pseudomonas ringi. And so now we're gonna drop it in to this super cooled water. Okay, so if just tell me if you saw that. Did uh, Zach, did you see that? Yeah, that okay. place yeah, really so it's instantaneous. That water is super cooled. That bacterium has the activity at that temperature. Bing, contact. And then once ice crystals start to form, it's a it's a reaction in a chain reaction. The other molecules can't resist because then ice is catalyzing more ice. It's all under zero degrees Celsius. Okay, so that's what happens. And people who have looked at the all of the different types of ice nucleating particles in the atmosphere, um, the, mostly chemists, they were curious to look at the different temperature profiles. So here we have a graph made by a, a, a atmospheric uh, physicist from Leeds University in um, the UK. So on the y-axis, we have 10 to the minus one, 10 to zero, et cetera. He, he made a, um, he tried to normalize how to express the ice nucleation activity of each of these particles because they're different types of particles. So that's a standard unit, the number of ice nuclei per the square centimeter of surface of particle. And on the, on the that was y-axis. And on the x-axis, you have the temperature at which those particles are active. So you see there's basically two families of particles. There are those that are active at temperatures colder than about, let's say minus 12 degrees. And these are all mineral and inorganic particles. So you have dust, volcanic ash, soot. But the ones that are extremely active have a very intense activity at temperatures very close to zero degrees Celsius. Here, he only plotted the bacteria because at the time he had bacteria, but there are some, a few fungi. They're not the inorganic particles. They're the bacteria and the microorganisms. Okay, so this is what was surprising. And I must say the physicists had real difficulty uh, accepting that those biological particles might have a bigger role to play than the mineral particles that are much more abundant. The mineral particles are more abundant, but the microbial particles are less abundant in the atmosphere. So this, is, this has been years of debate in uh, between two communities. Okay, so um, just to summarize this, um, Cloud, formation of clouds then will depend on the atmospheric concentration of the cloud condensation nuclei. And then precipitation depends on the abundance of the ice nucleation active particles and the, and the temperature of the cloud at, at the cloud height. So um, on the bottom of the graph, you have an indication that there's emissions from natural and anthropogenic sources of these ice nuclei and con cloud condensation nuclei. Generally, there are regular emissions that occur constantly. And once in a while, you get big boosts of emissions, like from a forest fire or from harvesting, for example. Okay, And all these can have an impact on rainfall if you have the appropriate meteorological conditions and water vapor concentration. Okay, So just a reminder about the different kinds of aerosol emissions you can have agriculture, forestry, transportation, industrial activities, wind erosion, volcanoes, forest fires, marine aerosols. You know, I mean, we know about a lot of it. You can see it as pollution, some of it. But there are many anthropogenic and natural sources of aerosols that are being emitted into the atmosphere. So 
for the details of what happens in the clouds, that's that I think that's the video that Carl watched and it's available on my YouTube site, Biological Rainfall Triggers. It will give you a lot more details about what happens in the clouds. I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm really just going to focus on what, what biology can do, right? So, so I'm supposed there's somebody in the audience now. Does this mean that we can create the right, if we can create the right sources of aerosols, we can influence local cloud coverage and precipitation, because of course that's the pressing question. What can we do anything? Can we do this, All right? So let's talk about that. So here's just an example to visually illustrate um, that the answer somehow should be yes to this question. <laughs> Not necessarily how you can do it, but the answer should be yes to this question. So historically, there's a very interesting phenomenon that took place in Southwestern Australia, um, there is about 13 million hectares of land con converted to rain-fed agriculture. And it's separated by native prairies, um, from native prairies by a 750 kilometer fence that was built between 1901 and 1907 to keep out rabbits. Sorry, I put rabbits in twice because there were so many of them and other agricultural herbivores. Okay, so it's in that tip of, ag of, so there's a huge difference in land use. One is just chewed off by the rabbits and the other one is a natural, is prairies. Okay, so you have the native prairies and the, and the rain-fed agriculture. And so you can see it visually. This is a land use image. You can see how the land coverage is very, very different. There's a part that's more or less barren, okay, because, um, it's uh, it's it's yeah, it's more or less barren, whereas another one is um, uh, covered with native prairies. And when people were looking at Landsat satellites, they saw images like this, where there was no vegetation, or the vegetation had been abused or changed highly, where there weren't the native prairies. You didn't have clouds. And so, I mean, that's, it's, it's a shocking image, but it's an anecdote, okay? Those are two dates. So scientists said, we need to measure this regularly because it is really striking, those, those images. They're really striking. And so uh, the studies that were done, uh, researchers looked at the average rainfall from May to October from the period 1976 to 2001, and they expressed it as a percent of um, rainfall between the period just after when the fence was built, 1925 to 1975. And you can see in that zone where we didn't, where we saw there were really limited cloud coverage, that there is an only 80% of the precipitation that they expected historically. Okay. Whereas in that area where you have um, uh, native prairies, you have almost, you have almost more rain than you would expect. Okay suggesting that the rain was going to fall out somewhere, but it just didn't, it wasn't catching from the um, ground cover what it needed to uh, turn into clouds and, and make pre precipitation. So this is very, very um, encouraging information, okay? So as I just, uh, uh, just restated this to you, but the land surface properties led to a decreased rainfall west of the fence, okay? So you can again read this paper, but it's you see something like that, you say, oh, okay, we maybe we can do something. So we wanted to know if all geographical places were alike in this ability to be sensitive to these the environmental input of land and aerosols. Okay. And so um, we looked at the effect of different geographical regions and their sensitivities to aerosols. And we did this um, based on historical rainfall patterns. So I'm going to just quickly go through this information because it is extremely mathematically very complicated thing that I'm not even sure I understand because I was just the person in between the atmosphere physicist and the statisticians and everything trying to get these models going. Now, I, want, I just want to spend a second as a little memorial here to Keith Big, who's the third author on this paper. Keith Big um, was an atmospheric physicist um, from Australia who uh, started his career before I was born. And I had the incredible great fortune of working with him for about four or five years when he was like a, a, starting when he was about 92 years old. 
because he never stopped working and he never stopped being curious. And, um, and it, it's thanks to him that he was able to tell me simply his very complicated ideas and I could translate them to the second author, Samuel, who is a statistician. And so this is a, a lot of uh, people willing to listen to other people's ideas and trying to translate them into, into something that we could do something with, okay? So we wanted to map what we called rainfall feedback sensitive, rainfall feedback, okay? It's an in indication of what's happening in, in historical weather patterns. And it doesn't tell us about how rain makes more rain. It tells us how rain is sensitive to aerosols. And I'll try to explain the best I can, all right? So we took daily, 100 years of daily rainfall data that you can get off the website of the National Oceanographic Administration in the US at 3,000 3, excuse me, sites in the US. And for each of these sites, we did an analysis where we looked across those 100 days for a key day, for multiple key days, where there was a big precipitation event. So here on our graph with key day in this gray area has you know, well over the threshold of 325 millimeters of rain. That was the threshold we set. And the question was, given that that period around that key day, the synoptic condition should be relatively the same, okay? Is there likely more likelihood of rain one day after that key day than one day before that key day? One day, two days after, than two days before, okay? And this is, how we uh, assess the, the positive feedback of rainfall. So this, this index that we made quantifies a trend of bef after versus before, and the trend can be positive or negative. So why did we, and we looked over 21 days for a period for rain intensity that was uh, more than 300, I, I said 325 millimeters, I meant 32 millimeters, I'm sorry, more than about 20, 20 millimeters of rain. And in one, year in a hundred years you sh there should be about there are roughly about 300 days in a hundred years where you get those events so every site we had about 300 events like this that we could put into a time series analysis so why did we look at that 21 day uh, window okay that was keith's insight and that's because Many years ago, we published it in 2015, but in 1957, I mean, I was born in 1957. In 1957, he made this observation that he was out measuring the concentrations of ice nuclei in the atmosphere. He knew nothing about biological ice nuclei. Biological ice nuclei were discovered in the, in 19, in the 1970s, okay? So he sees, he said, you know, it rains, and every day there's an accumulation over 21 days of these ice nucleation particles. And he just scratched his head. He said, I don't get it. If these are physical, physical particles, how can they keep, how can they continue making more of themselves over this 21 day period? He just couldn't understand. And that's why when we met in 19, in 2013, I think he, he was so excited. Finally, somebody I can talk to who doesn't think I'm crazy. That's what, I mean, people were telling him he's crazy, you know. He said, this is phenomenon I can't explain because um, physical particles don't multiply. So he would see this over a 21-day period. So he said, I'm looking at that 21-day window because I know there's a, an accumulation of aerosols that should be happening due to that rainfall event, all right? Because the rainfall makes splashing, it's got water, microbes can grow, they're released from the leaf surface. There's all these phenomena that could, that could contribute it once he started to learn about the biological ice nuclei. So that's why we looked at that 21 day period. So we made this map, right? I mean, this map is really intense. You can go to the website, it's linked on the bottom, and you can explore your region, where you are. If you're in a region where there's positive feedback or negative feedback, okay? Why is this map? interesting. This map is interesting because it says where there is a positive effect of aerosols on rainfall, these are the places where maybe things could be done to influence rain by increasing aerosols. If you're in a region where there's negative impact of rainfall, 
That might be because there's already way too many aerosols in the atmosphere and you add more, you're, gonna, you're going to constipate the clouds. All right, basically that's what happens. So you can, you can explore this map and look at your region and say, you know, wh where am I? Now for the people in the rest of the world, we made maps also that the data are not as, as good in the rest of the world for daily weather, rainfall data. We made maps for Europe. Okay, so you can also look on our website for the European maps, but the, we could do it for the US because there's so many weather stations with such good data. Okay, and it was all free. And it must say, it, I did get a uh, carpal tunnel syndrome uh, when um, our former president was elected for the first time because he, he threatened to close all the environmental uh, data websites and we just downloaded data as fast as we could. So anyway, <laughs> that was the motivation for, for finishing it rapidly. Okay, so all of this information about the fact that they're microorganisms, that they grow with water, that they can affect the clouds and everything led us to propose that there's a bioprecipitation cycle. This is not the same as the biotic pump. Now you mentioned, Raleigh and other people mentioned the biotic pump. I will talk about it at the end. It's not the same thing. This bioprecipitation cycle, it's a feedback cycle between land cover and atmosphere. So basically what happens, and, and the physicists are on board with this. Okay, this is what took so long. You have microorganisms on plants. They are uplifted naturally into the atmosphere. There's no, nothing to be, uh, you know, no, no surprise there. They're naturally uplifted by all types of processes because they're so light. They're transported up into the atmosphere. If they are ice nucleation active, they can interact with clouds and lead to ice propagation. This can lead to precipitation. Then both water and the microorganisms themselves are deposited and rain makes more plants, but plants make more rain, okay? <laughs> rain makes more plants, they grow, and that increases the stock, and then this is just the, the cycle that we've proposed. And all of these steps today, all of these steps have been validated that they do occur, okay? We measure flux, we, we put ice nuclei in cloud chambers and by, uh, bacterial ice nuclei in cloud chambers in physics labs. We can see that ice is formed in these chambers. We collect the bacteria, ice nucleation active bacteria in the rainfall, and we know that rain makes them grow. So all these steps have been uh, validated by, by science, okay, independently. You know, it's just impossible to see it happening. So, but there's something that you need to take into account, and that aerosols that are produced locally, they go away. And so the impact of any aerosols that you might create with a land use could be downwind. And we don't know yet how to measure this. All right. We don't really have this. I couldn't account for it in my in my feedback maps there. So how can we see the trajectories? Um, OK, these trajectories are invisible from source to the destination. We don't see them. You can see when there's a volcano, you can see it. All right. But the movement of, of microbial aerosols in the atmosphere is totally invisible. You have emissions from a natural and anthropogenic sources, they encounter winds and they go somewhere, okay? Can we know these trajectories in spite of their visibility? Yes, okay? We can know these trajectories in spite of the fact that we can't see them. And this is where there are other tools, okay? Many types of, so, Bacteria, many types of fungal spores and aerosols are so small that they follow wind currents. We can map the highways that they follow. So we can say US 66 runs this direction and we can map it, but we don't know if there are any cars on the road or if there have been any accidents, all right? So we can't know if the microbes are on those roads. We can't know if they're dying or falling out, but we definitely can tell you what are the highways they can take because they are so small and they can't, they, they're not like an airplane. They can't go where they want, all right? So um, what are the tools and what do they tell us? So the tool, again, it's the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Association uh, 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 Administration, which just puts all these things online for free. All right. So I, we can ask the question with this tool called High Split. Um, we can ask the following question. What were the origin and path of the air masses that arrived at that location? And I think, Carl, you might think you might know that location, right? that arrived at 500 meters and 1,000 meters altitude at noon on February 15th, 2023, because that was an event. Apparently there was some big snowstorm at that time. 
where, where do they come from during the 24 hours before they arrive? Okay. And so I said, okay, I can plug that information into high split. Anyone can plug it into high split. And this is what I get. So we get this backward trajectory. So the top part of the graph, you see the path. The blue line is the line that arrives at the pin, at the destination in New Mexico, at oh, 1,000 meters of altitude. And the red line is the line that arrives at 500 meters of altitude. That's the top graph. So you can see, I was really intrigued. You have a snowstorm that comes from Baja in Mexico. OK. I mean, I'm from the Midwest, so that doesn't correspond to how I understand weather, but I mean, that's very, very interesting, okay? So that's what it says. And then the bottom graph tells you, even though that air mass arrived at 1,000 meters or 500 meters, it wasn't always at 1,000 meters and 500 meters. It dipped down and it scraped the ground. I mean, it's incredible. So it, it scraped the ground and then uplifted. I suppose there's some mountains that it, where it's getting to, it's kind of climbing up some mountains before it dumps. Okay, there's some force that lifts it up. So that's its, that's its uh, altitude trajectory. So these are the tools that we have, but it's fastidious to look at single trajectories. So with my colleagues, we've made some, uh, some additional tools that are now, that are just going online now where you can just ask for multiple trajectories um, at, at one time. Okay, and so this is the sec the question that I'm going to show you now. So that was the question: What's coming toward me? Where's wh where did it come from? We can ask that question. But now I want to ask the question: Where can they go? So this would be a forward trajectory. Can we predict where it's going to go? It's the same calculation tools, all right? So if you're managing a nice forest at that place in New Mexico, and you have all these different microorganisms, perhaps you're liberating into the atmosphere, where do they go? Where could they go, all right? What's their potential trajectory? So I, I mapped this for, for you all, all right? So where could they go? So th th of course, the, 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 the thing first, they have to get up into the wind. And I've not told you at all about that. But most, many of them do. So we, we don't need to worry about it so much. But there are factors that can make it difficult for them to get up. And there are factors that favor them getting up into the wind. So. We're going, to, we're going to look at these trajectories. So here, what I've mapped is where the wind goes over 48 hours at, at uh, starting at 500 meters altitude from that site in New Mexico. And for the, I took a month in last year, 2022, and I said, give me all the trajectories, one trajectory a day for a 48 hour voyage starting at noon, all right? And so I just want to show you. So here, in 48 hours, that air mass goes all the way to New York City. And another one can go all the way out to the Atlantic. OK? Globally, things move east, but there's some southern movement and to the, to the west. Just for information, February was similar. So I'm not going to show you all the months. I'm going to show you some, some different months. April, March is similar. Wow, now, now those aerosols could be transported to the front border of Canada. Um, a little bit down in Texas, but we have more of a of a northward movement and a little less expansive to the east. This one blew my mind. May and June, <laughs> cross Quebec all the way out to the Atlantic Ocean. I mean, it's amazing in 48 hours how far uh, an air mass could move, and if the microorganisms that it captures as at its departure. Uh, don't fall out. There's no rainfall. They're on their voyage. Okay. June was similar. And then, of course, July and August. This is, I guess, if I understand right, part of monsoon season or when, when you get most of your rains in that part of the, the U.S. And so you see the movement is, is really limited July and August, which makes total sense because if you're getting rain and it's coming again and coming again, you're not, the storms aren't being pushed away. All right. So uh, this is this is similar. And then November is similar to October and September, which you have this really north south movement and a little a very little movement west. So the point here is to illustrate that you can know you can predict there are tools to predict where uh, aerosols will be going and, of course, where you're getting aerosols from. OK, and you can say, well, who am I connected to? Who am I connected to? Uh, via the atmosphere, these links that we don't perceive, right? All right, so 
um, in December. Okay. So keep in mind what we found in our studies of these air mass movements is that there's very little effect of a year of year by year. The seasonal effects are the same. So if you were, if I were to look at 2021, I'd probably see pretty much the same patterns. All right. There's very little uh, yearly effect, but of course we're we're in a period of climate change, so that might change. But up to now, the the, day, the years we've analyzed that there's little uh, um, yearly effect. Okay, so now this is the question. This is a hard question. What can you do? All right. And I, I I'm ask I'm I'm uh, it's not a rhetorical question. I'm I'm saying to myself, somebody wants to know the answer to this. Okay. What can we do? What can you do? And it's a very difficult question, I must admit. For me, it's a scary question to answer because I feel that what you can do, you need to know you're doing something and not just believe you're doing something, All right? So these, this is my proposition. Okay, this is my proposition. I'm coming to the end of my talk here if you're getting tired. So um, what can you do? First of all, I have no idea, but you, you know, make a list of the types of observations that you could make about your fields, about your plants, about your environment, that would seem to indicate that there, that you feel that that would indicate the impact of land management on rainfall, right? We have all kinds of measurements we can make as scientists, but if we wanted to do, uh, collect data from an, uh, an international observatory, maybe we'd have to go for things that everybody could measure. So first of all, think about what you could measure. Then you need to establish a network, find colleagues, and members of your network who could make similar observations. And also determine how you are connected via the atmosphere, who are sources, who are sinks, and at what time of year. All right. So there are tools to do this. All right. I showed them to you. And we could, I mean, there are other opportunities to talk about them. But then you need an experimental design. All right. So you need to ask yourself the questions. What would you expect to be able to see? Um, as an indication of the impact of land management on precipitation. Where would you expect to see these effects? On what time scale? Maybe it's not right away. Maybe it would take five years. Maybe, maybe it's tomorrow. I have no idea. What would you expect? And how would you feel confident that these effects are indeed due to your land management practices and not just your hopes that it works? And this is what we call, the, 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 we use negative controls in, in, in experimentation. You, you can't just believe that you've done something. You need to say, how can I be sure that this is not just random change or, or that it's really due to my uh, practices? And then solicit help from the scientific community, all right? Because as scientists, we have not done the big scale experiment nor big scale observations because we haven't scaled up. We don't know how to link with we. Uh, and this for me, I was so excited about this opportunity to talk with all of you because I said, oh, here is potentially an opportunity to, to, to make observations on a realistic scale. Okay, so that's, that's my answer about what you can do. And how is any of this related to the biotic pump? Because you did talk about <laughs> that in the thing. So I just want to make a mention about biotic pump. So biotic pump is not a water pump. Biotic pump is an air pump. So you have a windmill with air where you get maybe bring uh, water up from the ground. The biotic pump is a water pump that gives you wind. And this is what the biotic pump theory says. It's very complicated theory. It's controversial, but People have mapped that are places in the world that it seems to be happening. So we have a, a forest on a, a close to a, a, a water mass, mostly an ocean. So vegetation creates low pressure regions that draw air from oceans, okay? And this low pressure is created because the condensation of water vapor in the air reduces the density of the air. And the whole controversy around this phenomenon is a debate about the value of the density of water, which normally is one, okay? The density of water is normally one, but you reduce it a small amount, but just enough where you create this pressure deficit, okay? And, and so that's what drives winds. And, and one example of the fact that uh, when you don't have major forests, such as in Australia, you don't favor the moisture of um, 
movement of moisture laden air into the interior of the continent. And that's why you have this immense desert in Australia. Okay, so that's an example. So um, that, that's what the biotic pump is. So I just finished just here with the, just as a link for the song that Carl wrote that was inspired by the subject. And it's a very, very nice song. And I hope you all listen to it. And it, uh, at least it inspires you to sing along and call down the rain. So with that, I think I'm done. And um, if, I, if I can answer any questions, I'd be, I'd be delighted to. That was excellent, Cindy. Was... Thank you so much. I feel like everyone's gonna have to study that again and again and again, but in the best way to to see all like all the aerosol links and oh my god, it, you made the science of rain side playing. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm I, I I worked a long time. I really was I was really was on keen on on um on getting the information clearly and. Uh, yeah, it clearly, was it so. was great scientific okay. storytelling. And I mean, like for all of us who have been wondering like how this work and, you know, we're seeing things going on like clouds sitting in China where they're like blasting cannons with, you know, all the aerosols in the air. This is great seeing, you know, how it, but it did work. How... Their, their cloud seeding did make yeah. the Olympics rain free in the beginning. So, um, you know. <laughs> it was good. It's like, OK, you know what, what we can do to actually bring back the rainfall using you know environmental science it's yeah it's so one of the questions i see is dr morris can we get your your contact information so okay so what i said to zach my opinion is you are like a thousand you know 1200 people i can't answer 1200 emails okay so <laughs> because i have i have already too many emails for my work so and i would like to answer my my tendency would be to try to give everybody a, a, a decent answer so i i suggested that you you go through the, the the organizers and they can like compile questions and put together similar questions and then get the answers out to everybody, more comprehensive answers than I could do with a with a quick email. OK, so yeah. um, and, if you find really my hazard, have... my email like Carl did, you can contact me, but I, I would prefer that, it, you know, if you have a ton of questions, you filter them through the, the organizers. Yeah, for sure. And, and, and real quick, also before, we, way... get... Is that, before oh, we get started with real Q quick. Um, Oh yeah, go ahead. Okay, before we start with a Q and A, I just remind everybody uh, we have the Water Stories community where we post all our replays and we have discussions about these webinars. If you want to discuss it with uh, the community, like for example, we just did one with Brad Lancaster, and all the links, all the films we referenced are all going to be there. We have award-winning films we have done on topics like you know rainwater harvesting, Regendra Singh, how to revive rivers, capture capture rain, restore rain, and you can see all the events happening and, and discussions and all sort of topics related to restoring water systems, restoring rainfall, like how do you heal ecosystems? This is all in our community and it's all free. So uh, we'll, you know, of course we're gonna get to Q and A, but I'll post the link for folks who aren't acquainted with water stories. It's just a great way to have these discussions with with people from all over the world who are interested in restoring water systems and ecosystems. So we'll post that in the chat box and hopefully we'll see some folks there. And on this topic specifically as well, I started a thread that I put in the chat box here as well, um, just all about this topic. And so this is a great place, you know, as we build out our information and understanding of this topic, this can be a shared post that we all add information to, add questions, add observations, uh, and then we can conglomerate, compile them together so that Cindy's not answering the same question a bunch of times, but rather it gets answered in a public place that anyone can access yeah. um, and learn from. And I got to say, that was just incredibly awesome, thorough, <laughs> simple. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. I mean, that's going to be so helpful to so many people. Um, so. We are going to open up to audience questions here uh, in a couple of moments, folks. You can enter your questions in the question and answer feature. Um, please don't enter them into the chat because they're harder to keep track of there. Uh, and you can also raise your hand. We'll do a couple of uh, in-person questions with voice. Um, but one of the first questions that came up for me, Cindy, was what are the current efforts in this field? To me, 
uh, one of the big aha moments was we all know that we're connected via the water cycle, but we're really connected through these air currents as well. And are there any efforts to map these and help yes. regions understand how they're dependent on one another and connected? Yes. Okay. So um, not for the purpose of water management, but these trajectories are really important in the thinking about the uh, Disease, surveying for disease and predicting disease emergence. And so I have a, I'm have managing a project now on the national level where we're trying to say, okay, let's say you have a disease that is carried by an insect, a plant disease, okay, it could be a human disease, but a plant disease that's carried by an insect and we're concerned about the arrival of the insect rather than waiting for the insect to arrive, if it's carried on air masses, can we predict where those would arrive? What, where they would arrive from and when, depending on the life cycle of the um, insect. And so we're just basically with that tool that we created to be able to make those maps that I made, uh, we have a whole users group that are just gonna be mapping Europe, mapping. And so it can be, the tool is out there, it can be done. We can connect, we can calculate the connectivity. So the, the tool allows for connecting, the, calculating the connectivity and the trajectories. So this will be done, but not for, the, but it's the same information, right? Not for the purpose of water management, but the conclusions are the same. We want to know where microbes are flying to and from. Awesome. Are there any active efforts to try and enhance the growth of these microorganisms to spread them around, to monitor their movement through ecosystems? No, I would say actually, okay, so this is where plant pathology gets in the way. Because these, the several of the microorganisms that do this and are out there are plant pathogens. And so um, mostly as plant pathologists, we've been working to limit the amount of disease, so limit the amount of microorganisms. And so I did some calculations to, to show that for the rusts of wheat, to have enough of these particles to make rain, you'd have too much disease, okay? So it's not a good idea. But for Pseudomonas ringi that can live on plants without making much noise and it, it has this saprophytic life phase, yeah, you could have them out there um, and position them to be able to enhance. Now the question, uh, after that is who's gonna do that work? You know, I mean, promoting plant pathogens is kind of like, it's, it's, it's okay. it's difficult concept for, for some of us, but um, right now no one is intentionally doing it, but agriculture is doing lots of things unintentionally. Okay. So I would, I would feel that the more interesting approach would just be to try to map where they are naturally occurring, where they would be on crops where they're not causing any trouble and rather than to, to push them out. Just see how your cultivation techniques would be favoring them. And if that's positioned in a good spot for seeding clouds. The best place to do this is in the Sierra Nevadas of California. That's where it's there's such a high bio uh, bioprecipitation feedback, that rainfall feedback, that that's where I would think you get your biggest bang for your buck right there. So can I ask a question about <clears throat> um, the difference between agro-business practices and putting all sorts of chemical additives into the soil to enhance their bottom line, as opposed to the regenerative agriculture movement where it's all about soil biology and, and you know, the natural uh, uh, um, um, enrichment of the soil. It sounds like, you know, it seems clear to me that the regenerative agriculture uh, is, is much more conducive to the biology of, of um, producing precip as opposed to making dead soil that that uh, depends on chemical inputs. Am I thinking right there? Well, I don't know about uh, for rainfall, but I would say certainly for managing managing plant health, uh, that sterile environment is prone to invasion by, by pathogens. And so, I mean, that's where at least my institute is right on board with the idea of zero pesticides. What can we do now to have another type of agriculture where we foster healthy soil to maintain pathogens? But what we haven't yet thought about too much, which I think we should do, is all the added ecosystem services of that attitude. Okay, We're doing it for plant health. 
but there's additional reasons like you're suggesting to do it that that uh, that we haven't really gotten on board with measuring those things yet we're more interested in you know still protecting the favoring the fact that we can grow plants um you know who is going to who is going to breed plants for ecosystem services like like uh, pre preventing mudslides where no one's going to earn anything right but you need a plant that's well adapted to being being cultivated on a slope and stuff so um yeah we're I, but we're we're progressing in that regard, at least in Europe. And in the US, you have different motivations for research. Research is motivated by different things. But in Europe, we have a big pressure to get back to these not get back, to to develop agroecosystem approaches. So, but I, I'm I, I don't know of very many people that are out there measuring the effect on rainfall and water capture of biological control of plant pathogens, for example. Um, it would be something that I would militate for, but my years of militating for this are, you know, like about, I have about four or five left and then I have to retire. So. <laughs> I, I had a quick question. On a previous uh, YouTube talk, you talked about the effectiveness in certain biomes and creating bioprecipitation, like, a, you know, a mixed uh, species forest system is much better than they than like a prairie versus like a swamp versus a sterile field and you also mentioned some plant types which which had lots of, of bioprecipitation versus others um we'd love to get a, a small overview for people who who haven't heard that before so, so what you need to think about when you want to look at the, the part that i didn't talk about was uplift of aerosols into the atmosphere and um if you do hang gliding, nobody hang glides over a forest, right? Nobody hang glides over a forest because you don't have that uplift. And so there are certain surfaces that have high sensible heat flux, okay? And um, that are favorable to uplift. So I would say that a, a, just a huge forest, there certainly there are aerosols released, but there were probably not as much aerosols released as if that forest had a turbulent surface, different out heights, different types of trees, maybe some breaks in it. There was a mountain near it because the mountain is gonna, uh, gonna help uplift. And so this homogenous uh, environment, it, 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 unless it's a big flat prairie that's dry where you have sense, huge sensible heat flux, but then maybe no microorganisms to be lifted up, you don't have the physics that you need to really inject into the atmosphere. And this is where the topography of the rugosity of those plants comes into play. Okay, did that sort of answer your question? Oh yeah, that, that answers it great. Thank you so much. Well, I figured it's time we can get to some audience questions now. And there's a lot, I know it's, it's tough. We may not get to all of them because you know there's almost 50, but you know, we'll get to a few. <laughs> we'll get to a few. So how about, um, uh, Cindy, if you can see questions, feel free just to, just to pick them as you see them. Um, otherwise, we can select them for you. Well, Carl, can I answer the question that I thought you were going to ask me about well, burning? Yeah, the, the, the one other burning question I had was the uh, Forest Service these days is very concerned with uh, preventing wildfires. And so when they do large thinning projects, they're burning what they call fuel, which is the slash. Uh, that's their go-to method. Um, and of course, I've, I've been chipping my slash for 12 years um, and because I just feel like the chips are returning carbon to the soil and, and helping to, uh, with the microorganisms in the soil and, you know, the mushrooms and the bacteria and everything. Whereas if you burn it all, um, that carbon goes into the atmosphere and usually during times when it's a weather event that would not promote rain. They're, yeah. they're looking for dry periods where yeah. the, the piles will burn. And also it often leaves a burn scar in the, in the um, litter of the, of the forest or potentially. Because of the so heat. Just, you know, I, it's hard for me to have the ammunition to talk to foresters who are engaged in that and tell them, you know, maybe leave some uh, of that slash, the carbon, in a form that this would be beneficial to the soils. I'm just wondering how that your your understanding feeds into that. Okay, well, um, first of all, you saw that I, I, I had a slide on burning yeah, creates ice nuclei. So yeah. you can suspect my answer is not to not burn at all, okay? So I would say that burning could be interesting if it was done at the right time, 
but you're saying the time that they do it is not at probably a propitious time, but that that's, they could maybe there's, there's technology. I'm sure they could figure out how to do it. And if you think about a for, if that tree, if those trees fell naturally, so there was just a natural disaster or an accident or they died, no tree is going to be rapidly chipped and incorporated in the soil. The tree would tend to slowly degrade. Right. So I would think that chipping and incorporating into the soil in a large quantity would also not be a very natural process. Right. So my answer would be, I think maybe both things which should be done. There should be some reserved for, for burning, but that burning should be a prescribed burning that with the intent of seeding a cloud or doing an experiment so that you know, you know, you have a hypothesis about where the, the, the smoke's gonna go and you can test it, okay? Mm -hmm. Because people do prescribe burnings and, um, and that's some of it you put back into the soil because um, that's, uh, that's good for the soil and you don't strip the carbon out of it, absolutely. So I would say that the, 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 probably both. Thank you. <laughs> They're going by fast. Yeah, and we can we can help gather these for you, Cindy. Um, one more question I have, real quick. That was just one of my big uh, big questions after watching your other YouTube video, which was shared in the chats. I was surprised how high urban was as far as the landscape on on the airborne bacteria above different land covers. Um, urban is huge. Do you think that has to do with the uplift? Do you have any yeah. ideas or? Yeah, I would say. Uh... It's a filthy environment. It's probably not the same kind of microorganisms that you have from plants with lots of dust and you have a huge heat. It's a huge heat uh, source. Okay, usually urban areas are much hotter. So that's already gonna help the uplift a lot, yes. Okay, awesome. Um, so uh, I've got a few here isolated, uh, Raleigh. Unless if you have any you want to get started with first, we can. Start oh, go ahead, with Zach. Yeah, I want you spit them out. Um. Uh, so one, I think, simple, easy to question, easy to answer question, but uh, that I actually kind of have myself is so if water, why are we told that water freezes at zero if we actually see that it, it doesn't freeze until know. further <laughs> below that? Without... Okay. <laughs> zero or thirty-two degrees uh, Fahrenheit is the temperature above which water cannot become solid, okay? And if you left it for a long time, eventually it would, it would freeze. Now, my physicist friends say, yeah, you can even make ice at warmer than zero. But I, I, for me, that's, it's, it's, it, it's not, in, not in normal conditions. I mean, you have to have some really extraordinary conditions. So zero is the temperature above which, warmer than, you cannot get ice to form. All right. Why? Why that we're taught that zero is the freezing temperature? Well, it's sort of like a sh the short version of the story. Because <laughs> if you had to say it, you have to catalyze it. It takes time. But you know, we all know this for a fact. I mean, I explain it to you, but we know this for a fact. And the fact is, if you've invited your, if you right now invite your friends for a drink at your house and you haven't put the water in the tray last night you'll never get ice cubes. Even if your freezer is minus four, it takes a really long time. Even after the water gets down the temperature, it takes time for that ice to be catalyzed. And so, um, and then if you take the ice cube out and you put it on your tongue, it's sticky. So that's that property that helps it link to super cold water or the rest of the liquid water. I mean, you can see the properties of ice right there. So I don't, I don't know why we were taught that, but um, the, the, the longer version of the story is a little more complicated. <laughs> Yeah, awesome, awesome. That's super helpful. Um, we're getting a lot of questions, and I'll kind of just combine a few together, uh, and then let you riff on it as much as you like, Cindy. As far as um, cloud seeding, does it make sense in dry regions? Are people using this biological substances for cloud seeding, or why not? Um, no one's using biological. Rain, yeah, no one's using biological materials for cloud seeding. Most people would say, oh, bacteria in the atmosphere, it's scary, it's, it's dangerous, okay? We, you probably have the public outcry, which, you know, they're all, the microorganisms are there anyway. No one's using biologicals for cloud seeding. Um, clouds seeding in a dry area. Well, I would think seeding in a dry area is probably what people wanna do because they want rain, right? You see what I mean? Yeah. And I yeah. think what you need to look at what, what really impressed me was these maps of um, the, 
the percentage of precipitation that is recycled locally. And so let's say that um, you're adding irrigation to a crop in a region where precipitation, the precipitation that falls is not recycled. It's just it rains and then, you know, the cloud goes away and there's no secondary, there's no down, down, downtime effect. You are basically taking that irrigation water and you're sending it to your neighbors. Okay. If you irrigate in a place that is, it has a precipitation uh, sort of return and investment, that's interesting. And so I would think that you'd cloud seeding, it would, you'd want it to be in a place where you're going to get a return on investment and not just a one shot deal. So it's not maybe necessarily dry. I mean, you need to have the clouds, right? Um, but you wouldn't seed if you're naturally going to get rain, right? Yeah. So the other thing about cloud seeding, and this was my friend, my colleague, Keith Big, who, who this was his big deal about what he, the, the, the thing that he said, why we have a bad attitude about cloud seeding. In, in 2003, the National Academy of Sciences wrote a very negative publication about the state of the art of, cloud, of weather modification. They said it's not a science um, because it's really hard to do, you know, to show statistically that there is a significant effect. And my colleague Keith said, why? Why do we have this problem? And that is because one thing that is never accounted for in cloud seeding is the initial concentration of aerosols in the cloud. So if you have a lot of aerosols in the cloud and you add more, you can expect that you're not going to get an effect because you, you need one, okay, a cloud droplet for it to be heavy enough to fall is 10 to the six droplets get together. So on one crystal of ice, right? So if you have all your droplets turn into ice, they can't coagulate. They can't co coalesce, excuse me, they can't coalesce. And so they're just gonna float around in the atmosphere. And so if the state of your cloud already has too many aerosols and you add more, your cloud seeding doesn't work. And so you say, ah, look at cloud seeding doesn't work, right? Um, and so it is very difficult to measure that state today. Now, I don't know if some of the um, new ways to image clouds and things, the new techniques, I can't remember what they, what they are, the new techniques, um, uh, can get a better handle on this, but that would highly improve the, the, the technique of cloud seeding. Do you think that there's potential for these biological aerosols to be used in exchange for the mineral? No, uh, please don't do that. No, 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 we don't. I mean, that should not be a model. A model should not be, I want my rain, I pull it down. Okay. That's, that's not a model to persist because what will that do? That will cause fights among people. This is my water. This is your water. When I lived in Montana, Montana sued the state of Idaho because they were cloud seeding and Montana said, that's our rain. Okay. So, you know, I don't think that's what should happen. Okay. What should happen is that we have geopolitical regions that are water basins rather than, okay. Uh, you take the Iberian Peninsula. The Iberian Peninsula, you have a river that runs across several countries, okay, two countries. And so they're fighting, you know, is that, is that Portugal's water? Is that Spain's water? Okay, That shouldn't be a debate. There should be a, a group of people with the same political interests that manage that watershed. All right. And so that's what you want. You want, you want uh, uh, political or, 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 yeah, organizations or, or, uh, uh, militant groups of people, people who want to work for the environment that manage watersheds. And they think about what's our land coverage, what's our feedback, um, who's needing the water upstream, downstream. You know, a big debate right now is uh, how do we protect plants from frost damage? And so because they use the aspersion, the watering, the people that have fruit crops say, well, we want to collect the river water and make reservoirs. <laughs> no, 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 uh-uh. <laughs> so they're ready when it comes. You know, I think, no, no, that should not be how we solve this problem because there's a lot of people downstream who need that water. So I, 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 my, I'm, I'm not for that. I'm for thinking about how these land processes are happening, getting microbiologists to be linked with you, getting physicists to be linked with you to make the measurements that you need so that your practices are not just belief, but they're credible, okay?
and it's done on a basis on watersheds. Okay. That was sort of the bio I think that political uh, movement of having, you know, areas of bio, your bio region is. Yeah, you know, but they should be watersheds right, that exactly. then are connected. You need to look at how they're connected, but they should be watersheds. Okay. I worked with some people who are managing the watershed or militating for management of the watershed in the Hudson River. Okay, I mean, talk about political. You got New York, and you got, and um, but it, and there, there's a whole group of people that are concerned about, you know, the vegetation and the quality of the water and where it's going and and uh, how to preserve the the water cycle because that's really where it's happening. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. I think that's so important, and one of the real pieces that we started water stories for is so that people can understand that they are connected with each other whether they like it or not within watersheds within basins exactly and it, now yeah. we really open that up to air currents as well even bridging watershed boundaries there's still a relationship and connection well so um, someone said watersheds on the ground don't map watersheds in the clouds so if you know more about that mr brad Kaliner, that's information that people need to know about. Okay, how do you then overlay these things so we know that my watershed is sucking water out of your watershed or can can be uh, interacted with? Okay, so that was a comment. Um, yeah. I, I like one here from Ian Harrington. Uh, it's Dr. Walter Jena has said he thinks about fifty percent of participation is biologically driven. Would you agree with that proportionally? I don't think we have an estimate. Okay, okay, okay. Let's say this. <laughs> let's 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 say maybe a hundred percent is because where does the water come from over continents? Plants. <laughs> so okay, a little bit from soil and a little bit from the lakes and streams, but over continents, where does the water in the atmosphere come from? Plants. So no, he underestimated it. I say it's ninety-five percent. <laughs> Afterwards, well, we do we have all the added effect of aer biological aerosols? I don't know if that's been estimated, but I would say surely that the water that's in the atmosphere does come from biological process. That's cool. huge. I, I love that answer. Um, another question that I see that I think will help people conceptualize things, um, just looking before with the temperatures listed for ice nucleation, uh, Lisa is saying they still seem pretty cold. How cold is it in a cloud in Arizona or southern Spain, for example? Okay, well, it depends on the altitude, clouds, altitude. So uh, a, a thunderstorm, the top of the cloud is easily minus 40 degrees. Okay, you get in an airplane, watch the temperature while you take a flight. Okay, you don't want to fall out of that plane because it's cold outside. <laughs> you don't need to go up that high. So... At let's say uh, two kilometers, a low flying uh, strat uh, uh, nimbus cumulus cloud, um, uh, two kilometers in the summer, you can be at minus five, maybe. Okay. Uh, this is where it gets critical. Okay. Summer temperatures, those low clouds, um, if you if you're only at minus five, then if you don't have biological particles, you don't have the processes for rain. You need, you need, if you just have dust, okay? But in the winter, that's the minus, a, a two kilometer high cloud, you're gonna get down to minus 10. Okay, no problem. Even in a hot place like Arizona, okay? Because temperature decreases with altitude. And this one, you spoke to a, a little bit already, but I think it's just a really important issue that maybe you could, uh, just speak to again so it's really clear for folks. Um, are there ethical issues around catalyzing precipitation, taking water away from other regions? Well, does that person know who that water belongs to? How do you know that the water belongs to another region? Okay, how do you know? I don't, I don't think we know that it belongs to another region. The only way you know is if somehow it starts raining and you can pull the cloud over, okay? I don't, I don't really know. Is there uh, ethical questions around the fact that we have completely transformed landscape, whereas we've eliminated wild uh, land covers and now 50% of land cover is agriculture, whereas that part, a, grant, a big part of it was, was wild. So is there, are there any ethical questions about that? Okay. 
um, and, and, and we have no idea what we've done. We have had no idea the consequences, the, the, the extent of the consequences, but we've done it. So I don't really know we know who that water belongs to. And this is why I agree. I, I say, don't cloud seed. Don't seed, yeah, don't seed clouds. Um, put in processes where then nature takes over. You just like sort of send up the aerosols at the right time. Nature does the rest, right? Because it has up to, I mean, that's how it works. But I don't, I mean, I would say you need to know who that water belongs to to answer that question. And I don't think we can answer that question. Yeah, that's a, a great response. Um, Zach, how do you feel like, why don't we do one or two live questions? But before we jump into those, um, Cindy and Carl, what, what do you think is the most effective way to connect with you both after the webinar? How would you like to engage with people after this, you know? If there's agencies I want to reach out to you and talk to you, what's the most effective way to do that? Carl, we can't hear you. Turn on your microphone. Carl, your microphone. You can send me the, the, their information and I'll contact them. Yeah. That and, good. Yeah. In terms of agencies, I mean, individuals, like I said, you, I, I can't answer everybody's questions on my email. It's just for, it's impossible for me because mm -hmm. I, of my work. But, um, I, I, although I'm interested, I'm really, I'm really interested that you filter the question. If there's agencies for professional reasons, yes, you can contact me directly. I mean, obviously you can find my contact information. It just, you got to keep in mind that my engagement in future research is on, is being more and more limited because I have, I mean, I will be pushed out when I get a certain age, I have to retire, but I could maybe help link you up with people and help uh, initiate things. Okay, sounds good. So it sounds like individuals will, you know, Carl, send your way and agencies will help send to Cindy. Go ahead, Zach, what were you going to say? I just dropped that, I'm dropping again, that link to the thread in the Water Stories community. So that's where you all, both Carl and Cindy are members there. You guys can okay. ask your questions on that thread. Yeah, I will look uh, at that. I'm really interested. Collect yeah, we can collect them and send them to them. So in a way that they don't end up with the repeat question again and again, um, you know, if it's a question about this process, let's ask it in that thread where we'll also have the replay of this webinar. And then we can have all the information in one place uh, so that Cindy and Carl aren't going crazy answering the same questions again and again. So yeah, one person said, please good... save the chat and email because they're, they're saying there's a lot of useful links. Yeah, we'll, yeah, so we will, yes, yeah we will save the chat and it'll chat. go with yeah. yeah we will save the chat and it'll go with the replay um we'll have the links and resources that are shared in it uh up along with the replay okay um do we want to open up uh philip i know you've had your hand up for a long time um if you're still with us, do you want to unmute and uh, ask your question? Apologies if I had my hand up, I didn't realize. Oh, oh no worries. No worries. <laughs> uh, let's go to uh, Teresa. Teresa's have ha has had her hand up since the beginning. Yeah, so Teresa, just say who you are, please, so you can present yourself and turn on your camera. That'd be nice, <laughs> so I can see. And you'll need to unmute as well. Uh, we're not. Yeah, let's maybe like she's a no. the microphone there. How about uh, Ethan Guion? We'll go with Ethan. Howdy. How are y'all doing today? Doing good. Yeah, you know, we're going to see if we could turn on your video. If, if it's cool, turn on your video. Oh, totally. No Give worries. me just a second. Oh, I don't think I can at the moment. I can unmute at the moment. I'm okay, on my we phone. Can hear you. So I okay. Apologize. Yeah, I think I can, think like can, yeah, maybe. It, okay. No worries. Can Can you say who you are so we understand the perspective of your question? Yes, my name's Ethan. Ethan Guy and I'm with the Living Soil Food Web School and I'm in Austin, Texas as a local landscaper doing permaculture. And I was wondering how do endophytes play a part in this relationship? Do they connect with CCNs and allow them to 
increase their tra trajectory capabilities or do they play a more important role in our morning dew or even fogs? No, I think endophytes are pretty much in, you know, inside the plant. And the mm -hmm. organisms that are going to interact with water and take a voyage really have to be on the outside of plants. And so I, I think for most of the endophytes I know, maybe they might sometimes come out of stomates, but overall they're just there to help the plants um, um, usually obtain additional nutrients uh, uh, that they can't get without them. Right. So I don't, I don't, there's no evidence. I mean, maybe some do, but I have no, no knowledge of any endophytes that are either isonucleation active or, or uh, uh, cloud condensating nuclei. And I don't even know if in the plant they sporulate, they grow as hyphae if they're fungi. So um, all of the isonucleation activity and, di and dispersion that's been measured has been with spores. Okay. So, so more studies required. Or, but there's, I mean, more studies required, but maybe there's not even an incentive to do it because no one has seen something that makes them suspect that. So, thank you so much, Andy. You're welcome. Cool. Thanks, Ian. Yeah, I'm seeing um, one question here that's come up in a couple of different um, ways that is just kind of asking I wonder if you can speak more to what you know and what we've observed as far as the different landscapes that produce, um, you know, people are asking, it sounds like native revegetation is critical, mixed forests, crop fields, native ecosystems. What are the ecosystems that have shown to be the most beneficial as far as re-triggering this bioprecipitation effect? So, I mean, I do have a paper on it. It was really complicated, the analysis, because we looked at historical trends. And agriculture can have both a negative and a positive impact, depending on where it's situated. So I can refer you to, to a paper you can look at. But for example, one, if you notice a, a zone on that map, you don't have it memorized in your head, but in that map I showed about rainfall feedback there were some very distinctive negative regions. And one negative region was the Northwest Pacific. And um, we were wondering about the role of, you know, the combination of climate, heavy aerosols, uh, volatile organic compounds. Um, it just seemed like a place that there was a negative feedback certain times of the year, but that feedback can also be seasonal. So I would think you'd have to really study that map and um, this is where I would say more research is needed. We have made observations, but now I think there is room for experimentation if it's possible. Okay. So. Um, awesome. And if you could, I, I'd love to share that paper. I'll share that in that same thread um, that I sent all you guys. You can send it to me afterwards. Yeah, I'll send, send it later because I can't think of it at the top yeah. of my head. I mean, it's a complicated um, analysis that might, you know, thank God, goodness I have statisticians who helped me, but they looked at all the land use, the historical land use, the, the all the rainfall feedback that we measured, and they tried to see where the trends were. Um, and uh, it, I mean, it's not cut and dry, okay? And also the question for me is, what's the scale, right? Is, you know, like is a, a, a three square kilometer forest going to have a same impact as a whole half of a state that's covered in forest? I mean, I don't know what the scale, this is the other question, what's the scale that uh, needs to be transformed to have some kind of impact? We have a colleagues, um, I may, might have shared the link with you, Zach, earlier, uh, called Manzanita Solutions. They're working in, in Missoula uh, with wastewater treatment plants where they're trying to see if um, by using the water from wastewater treatment plants to then water vegetation that will, will evapotranspirate and then coupling that to aerosols, can they get an impact that they can measure? And so you need to go to their website. I'm not sure what the state of their experimentation is, but it's very interesting. There's some papers associated with it, the basic concept. And we said, you know, one place to do this would be like plant eucalyptus in at that place in uh, Southern California, where I said it goes upstream and pump in the wastewater from Los Angeles and, you know, get let the eucalyptus, which are highly, have a high evapotranspiration rate, spew out the water vapor. And then hopefully the, the plants on the, on the um, slopes of the Sierra Nevadas, if there were a lot of ice nucleators, then would accumulate it and you'd get your 
your precipitation before the cloud, before the air mass went over the, the mountains. Awesome. That's um, really cool. Yeah. All right. Uh, and I, let's see. I wrote to Jerry Brown about this once, but I never got a response. Okay. <laughs> when he was governor of the state, <laughs> you think he would know, of course he wouldn't respond to me, but I said, I have an idea for the drought in your state, but. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that kind of speaks to a lot of people's questions. Um, you know, I think you did a really good job of having a, a really robust um, what we can do. But if we look at scaling, this is a little bit bigger. You know, if we're just thinking in an ideal world, using this information, using these observations, what would it look like if we were to start to try and, you know, restore bioprecipitation? Let's just maybe look at the American West, for example. What, you know, that's one fascinating practice that I've never heard of before. Are there other things like that that we could start engaging in? What practices do you think would be the best to incentivize? Um, how could we start to scale up some of this? Well, I mean, you know your network. You know where people are. Put them on a map. Map them. Map them physically. Say, okay, now I want to do my connectivity. Am I, am I, am I linked? Who, who's in different, who's in similar watersheds? Uh, who am I connected with by wind air masses and in what seasons? Those are kind of, I mean, those are kind of uh, analyses I could do for you. That's no problem because the tools are you know, once I have GPS points, the tool is, it does it by itself. Okay. Um, and then, okay, who I'm linked up with now, am I linked up with people who have similar situations? Because I need to have a uh, repeat experiments, you know, I mean, we have three, three people who have same context, if we all do the same thing, and then we have three people who have different contexts, and we do the same thing, do we get different results, right? And um, so I would say first, you'd map, you'd map who is interested in participating in such a big experiment or observation? Let's call it an observation, okay? Because there's probably some basic observations you could all do, okay, together. And I think this is for me that, again, this is why I say I understood why this was an exciting opportunity because uh, for me, because I said, that's what we need. If I were starting my career now in this subject and I wanted to design the dream experiment, it would be find partners who could make measurements all over the place okay and then you know do a concerted effort to make some realistic measurements that are pertinent and and so that's you you now could put together such a network and then from there you could say all right what can we do okay colorado has a very um university of Col uh, colorado state at fort collins there's a, a new an NSF funded program on aerosol uh, aerobiology that I'm, I'm on the scientific council for this program um, with atmosphere physicists um, that would who would be very um, well that that's where your comp local competence is um, they could uh, you know I could put you in link with those people if if there's you know if there's things you want to do um, and then discuss the possibilities for maybe find funding or see what they would want to be able to do. But yeah, there are resources. And hopefully we're really starting to knit this network together with water stories. And, uh, you know, a big part of what we see in the future is citizen science, which this would be a great application for. Uh, as far Absolutely. As if you have different people in connected regions observing the same things now we could start to build a much more cohesive story. That's right. Work with the scientists though. Make sure that you work with the scientists because this citizen science is a, is a complicated thing because uh, science is something. Science is a process where you really have to be objective and we have rules for maintaining our objectivity and, um, and experimental design, which is not just intuitive. Yeah. Uh, a question here from Isabel. Uh, could you explain more about the synoptic conditions? Uh, you said that they you said they have to be favorable and that sometimes no matter what you do, it won't rain. Uh, can you give an example? <laughs> There's no clouds. You're not going to get any rain. OK. <laughs> and it's, so if you watch the weather maps, the weather maps are telling you about the basic synoptic conditions and they tell you what the probability for rain is. OK. But it's far from being rain. Right. So those are the 
big air mass movements. We know there's the jet stream and we know there's the other streams <laughs> and, and, and how there's the, the, the circulation. Those are the synoptic conditions. And just out of, out of uh, because you love planet Earth, when all the continents were together in Pangaea, the synoptic conditions were not the same. Air masses did not move the same way. Okay, because it was everything was flat, and so you had no uplift. You had and and all of Pangaea was like Australia because it was flat. You just had tropical storms on the edge, and everything was a desert in the middle. And it was the breakup of the continents then that helped the air masses change their movement mm -hmm. because you have cooling and you have water bodies. Okay, and what we have today is not what the Earth had uh, 4.5 billion years ago. OK, this is and uh, so um, it's that large scale movements that are that are basically controlled by by the temperature of the oceans. OK, and the placement of the continents. Cool. Well, I'd say let's, let's do one or two more uh, live questions. I've got one from Denise from Utah Permaculture. She wants to chime in and, uh, you know, to. Everybody's got enough time. Let's, you know, the I'm here. More I got simple, the permission to not be better. thrown out of my office. So <laughs> I asked nice. for it. Okay, cool. they throw me out. All right, seven, Denise, so. you're uh, on. Oh, great. Can you guys hear me? Okay? Yes. All right, Denise. Now we can. Denise, now you, Denise, now you, now you cut your microphone. There, it's happened. Okay. Okay, here you go. Yeah. Good. I was so excited when I heard you were going to present this because I knew this all along with my permaculture food forest here, and I've been studying with the native plant people in Utah for 10 years. Our DNR director, he's brand new, loves his artificial cloud seeding since the 1950s, but I told him every year, you do it in April, and it literally causes all our fruit to fall on the ground. I presented to the SWAN, which is a Southwestern Agroforestry Action Network last year and i shared this important information and letting them know that if we revegetated these deserted foothills all over utah which right now i was at the utah lake symposium and i explained that to them if you really want to get us out of the drought and the lakes are 50 percent down now i'm going to go to um, in june and logan the utah state is inviting people to talk about solutions to the drought i want to present them this great science so thank you for getting all these studies done so we have proven that the best way is to naturally cloud seed by letting the vegetation do the natural way with the bacteria but i'm wondering how big of an area do i suggest to the state of utah that we could retree with native trees and plants and they're drought resistant. And I've got all the resources from the forestry department, the reclamation nursery who grows them. They have an 80% success rate at planting these. All we need is the funding. How large of an area should I at least attempt to suggest? And, you know, so that way we have a way hopefully to start this pilot project and bring our water back because they love their 1950s. Um, they've been doing it since then artificial cloud seeding. We see negative things to it. Jeff Lawton and permaculture has said you change everything when you do it artificially. So I hate geoengineered weather. And I have a uh, physicist here who actually agrees with me. So I, in a picture that I see, instead of not seeing, instead of seeing your face, I see some mountains. Is mm -hmm. that right? Yeah. So I'm, on the I'm not piece. sure. I'm not sure about the total area, but I would say the location is critical. And if, if you had the means, I would just like do a strip that's as wide as your mountain is wide, right up to the mountains. Because what's going to happen, and oh, but of course you have to study the movement of your air masses, okay? What you would hope for is the formation of orographic clouds. Do you know what orographic clouds are? The orographic yeah. clouds are the ones that form and they hang up on the mountains. So on yeah. one, there's a side of the mountain somewhere that that air in your place is going to come up and so I would colonize that side of the mountain at the time, of course, that the, the flowering would be happening and the trees would be budding. So you're, maybe your air moves from different directions. You'd have to look at the, the, the behavior of your air masses. So if, I suppose in the spring and the summer, when, when do you need rain? The summer, right? Yes. Yeah. So where, is the, where are the air masses moving from and to? in terms of those mountains, I would position it so you, it would be in the trajectory of those air masses, okay? And, um, and then 
if you have a physicist there, well, I don't know what you can measure. It'd be really nice to, to capture things in the atmosphere. So you could, if there's ways to measure ice nuclei in the atmosphere, but you could measure water vapor. There are ways apparently with cell phones to measure water vapor in the atmosphere. And if you could show that you actually increase the, rel the vapor content in the air, that would already be an, an interesting indicator. Okay. Okay. So, um, but keep in mind that your trees need water. Mm -hmm. So if you plant a lot of trees, in, initially, if they don't have any rain, somehow you're going to have to feed them rain, water, right? I'm using native trees that are so drought resistant. And as the forestry department has restored large areas with an 80% success rate um, of what our reclamation nursery is growing, um, they didn't need any water other than what came from the sky. We get about seven inches to 12 inches average a year here. And they survived 80% rate. And so okay. if, if I can plant those, that's, yeah. they won't okay. need extra water. Yeah, so that's what I would do. I would plant, um, I would uh, plant, I, the position of where you put them is important. It okay. would be that place where there would be, during the time of the cloud formation that you would hope would be seeded, you'd have a strip of, like a, not a landing strip, but a takeoff strip for the air, and it would move up and collect aerosols and water vapor. Okay. I hope I can Sounds figure like that Sounds like we need you. to make a cool animation about how this works, you know, like the, how the, you know, this works, how the biotic pump works. So, so people can visualize, you know, like how, how these systems, yeah, how bioaerosols function. Well, and okay. Think, you know, we have so, that a little bit in one in our video. Send Go me ahead. a GPS, a, a GPS point and dates of when you would want to, 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 to have a, uh, clouds be seeded. And I, I, I could make the graphs of, I mean, take me three seconds to make the graphs of where the air would be going to. I need a couple of GPS points. Yeah. I'd, from a point where you would, yeah, the, just the mountain itself. So if there's a place where you have orographic clouds, I would need that GPS point And I would actually do the backwards trajectories from there. Where is air coming from that goes there? during different seasons, just the just like the maps I made, just like the graphs I made for the place in New Mexico. Okay. I will try, thank you. Okay. Thanks for your question, Denise. Yes. All right, how about Nick Bertulis? He's a really cool permaculture designer in the Bay Area. Hey, Nick. Hey, Nick. Gr greetings, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, hey, great. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much. It's been wonderful. Wondering uh, if you could talk a little bit more about prescribed burning timing and strategic planning for optimized bioprecipitation. I think you kind of alluded to it. Yes, I have of course. Friends that, that work in that field, and I would I would be happy yeah for that to be elaborated. Thank you. So the person who could speak intelligently about this is Leda Kozibar, Kobazar at in Moscow, Idaho, at the University of Idaho. She's the person who has uh, is one of the people who she started the field of pyroaerobiology, and she herself is authorized to do prescribed burnings, so she knows everything about it. And so the idea that I wanted to convey um, is that if the burnings generate ice nuclei. Well, it's basically an opportunity to do cloud seeding. So you'd want to do it uh, in a way where you understand where the air is going to move and there would need to be clouds that would be uh, targeted. So you could, the, the plume, you would hope that it would follow the path that you hope for and it would, it would uh, or it could even incite clouds if there were condensation nuclei in it. But, but that's what my idea would be. But I would actually talk with Leda um, at the University of Idaho because she is she is the person who knows this field really well. Yeah, there it is, Kobziar, Leda Kobziar. Yeah, I just dropped a, a link to her page yeah. from University of Idaho yeah. in the chat. And so she'll probably hate me that you'll all be calling her. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's extremely competent in this area, so. Um. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. All right, how about we, how about we do one more? This is tough. There's. Sonia Elizabeth, how about we go Elizabeth Yari and then we can go back to more of the typed questions. Hey, Elizabeth. Hi there. I'm in uh, Paonia, Colorado. 
in the foothills of Mount Lamborn and uh, creating a food forest. Um, just out of curiosity, very basic question, the little microorganisms uh, that are blown up um, into the clouds, do they survive? What happens to them? Do they come down live? Yeah, okay, please. Yes, it's a very good question. So, um, on average, when microorganisms are uplifted into the atmosphere, their average residence time in the atmosphere is about two days on average, okay? And in that two-day period, they're moved around, and then the reason they come out is because it rains. That's their only way to come down. Okay, the only way to come down is because the gravity does not have an impact on it. Yes, they survive. We've collected rain. People have studied the microbiology of rain. People have studied the microbiology of clouds. Okay, there's gazillions of, I mean, there's many organisms in clouds, but there's mostly sterile droplets of water, but there are still quite a few microorganisms in clouds. There are micro, viable microorganisms that move up into the stratosphere even. Now, that when they move up into the stratosphere, so the stratosphere is the part of the atmosphere. So we have the troposphere, which as you move away from the Earth's surface, it gets colder and colder because you're under the influence of the Earth, and it's the Earth that's warming the air. And the stratosphere is about, on average, 16 kilometers from Earth's surface, where suddenly now you're under the influence of the sun, as then you continue moving up, you're under the influence, it gets hotter and hotter. And there's a, like a barrier. Things can get into the stratosphere, but once they get in, they're never going to come out. But people have sampled microorganisms in the stratosphere, and they find viable microorganisms. It's mind-blowing, okay? <laughs> so these organisms survive, and this is the one thing that really made me curious, was I said, okay, now, ice is needed in clouds to create lightning, because the ice will separate charges, right? So you need ice for light for lightning because it, it makes the charges and that's what causes the lightning bolt. So when I discovered that, when I learned that, I didn't discover it. When I learned that, my first thought was, oh my goodness, my bacterium Pseudomonas ringi by being ice nucleation active, it's committing suicide. It's getting zapped by lightning. But in fact, and so we found some, some scientists who can mimic lightning and we exposed our bacterium Pseudomonas ringi to lightning. No problem, survives. Because, because uh, first of all, if it's in ice, ice does not conduct electricity. So the bacteria in the ice form would not even see the electricity of the lightning. In a non-ice form, the, the exposure is so short of time that essentially is the same electrical force that we use in the laboratory to make little pores in the, in the walls of bacteria if we want to do some genetic transformation to study the effect of different genes. And that, it survives, no problem. So it is amazing what these organisms can survive. But if on the long term they never come down because there's no rain and they just float, eventually they will die of desiccation and exposure to extreme cold. Wow. So that gives you a lot to dream about, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah okay. A, it gives you a lot a cool to dream quest. about. I cannot look at a landscape without thinking about all these things. So, <laughs> yeah, I think I've got a whole new take now. Thank you. Wow. Yeah, and, and may I add one remark is that um, thank you for asking a positive question about microorganisms because most people, oh my God, microorganisms are dangerous. This is, this is the thing. They are resilient and they're everywhere and we're not dying. We're not all dying of them. Okay, there are microorganisms that are, that are, that are nefarious for us, but the large por par portion of them are beneficial or indifferent. Okay, so without them, we, our life would be pretty miserable. So, but they are resilient in the atmosphere. Thank you. Cool. Thanks for your question, Elizabeth. Zach, what do you reckon? Should we do one more live one or should we just get back to the uh, No, let's let's keep going through the live one. I'm, I'm kind yeah, of collecting fun. and cleaning up for the ones that we've answered or answered close All right. to. How about Bile, uh, Byron Marquez Blendo has had his hand up for a while. Why don't we, why don't we jump to him? Hey, Bile, how you doing? Can you unmute your microphone? Give you another second here. 
Well, no worries, Val. If, if you're on later, we could uh, chat with you. How about we'll go to Lasonia Luther here? All right. How you doing, Lasonia? Can we hear you? Hi. Um, hey. Hi. <laughs> this is really a great um, presentation. I am. Um, I live in. Uh, Iowa and do a lot with Nebraska. And I actually was on a, a webinar yesterday where first off, I, I love the fact about the water, um, you know, this fight with water, you know, water is should be free. But my question is, I guess when we, you were talking about the observation and things like that, with all of this, why is it that the health of the human and of animals and everything considered in regards to water and then um, including somehow bringing families more into these conversations and it being taught more um, in school. Because I know that we talk a lot about it being the large scale aspect of things, but you know, there are so many families and there's so many people in the world. How do we get people closer to the to the to the ground level working with, you know, with science, being able to present information, um, teaching people the importance, you know, of taking back their own the food and their waste and things like that, that we can actually control and and help the earth and the you know the all of the things that are happening if we just kind of took things became more in charge of of these things ourselves instead of depending on everything from a large scale a, um, aspect um well, okay. So, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of questions there. And <laughs> how do we how do we get it right? I mean, you're basically, you know, how do we get it right, and how do we get back to um, uh, not being so dependent on on artificial and industrial forces, right? Um, so, oh, I don't know if I have a, an answer, but you know, education and and what we need to change the upcoming generations. We need to educate them. I work closely with a an organization called Kinomi and Forest. It's called Kinomi. One part of it is the foundation. One is the company Forest and Life. And they just are working in the schools to, in addition to their reforestation efforts, working in the schools to educate children um, uh, to, to about the role of trees, uh, forests, soil, and a lot of these kids have never even gone outside, never been walking in forests. And so it's trying to repair the disconnection that we have with these things. Many people, I think, don't realize that we're connected. Don't realize the, the uh, well, I mean, it's the Greta Thunberg syndrome. I mean, this girl is stressed because she understands that we're, we're, we're going to die. I mean, she understands that we're, I mean, it's not, it's not positive, the, the climate change and everything, but most people don't have that same level of anxiety and understanding and appreciation of the fact that the situation is extremely serious for the next generations. Okay. So we do need to do more education. Um, I, I don't know if there's any hope for the current generations, but I think we have to work on the future generations. Um, and so this is a good discussion, these kind of discussions. Um, I, I, for this Kinomi, I'll tell you, for this Kinomi organization, they work a lot in Africa and, um, and children, and they wanted a song. They were jealous that I was writing songs about trees, and I didn't write them a song. So um, the head of the organization asked me to write a song, and I said, well, song where people could participate. So I took We Are the World, and I turned it into We Are the Forest. The problem is we can't get the rights to sing it. Because, you know, between, um, uh, well, the, the family, the, protect, the people who protect Michael Jackson's uh, inheritance, and then the other singer who wrote it, and Carl helped me out. We are, the, we are the world. We are the people. We are the ones who make the world. Yeah, what's his name? Anyway, um, we, can't, we can't get a right to sing my version of it. But they recorded nevertheless, and these children are singing about trees and how we're connected and what's important in the forest and everything. And we can't put it online, but the children are singing it in schools. And I'm going like, yeah, this is, I mean, these are the kind of things we have to be, be 
sentimental about. Not that my girlfriend left me or not that I got a new clothes, but we need to be sentimental about, you know, nature and our connection to it. And so I don't know if that answers your question, but I mean, yeah, we got a big problem, Sonia. I agree. <laughs> Yes, thank you um, very much for just for saying that. I work a lot with youth, and that has been my concern. Um, I actually am a part of the BIPOC community, and that is one of the biggest issues um, is that the young people don't have a connection with any of this, and the schools are not emphasizing it. They emphasize a lot of technology and things like that, which I appreciate that totally, but when it's all said and done, you can't eat technology. You need rain, you need food, you need um, you need your health. And, and there's so many health issues that are happening, you know, just because of all the chemicals and all the things that are in the water. And, um, and so, yeah, it's just yeah, really but, wondering but you have to how be a, to- You have to be a little bit more moderate because here we are talking to each other thanks to some really high technology, okay? Oh, yes, definitely. A really high polluting technology, very <laughs> polluting technology. Computers. Right. So, I mean, there, there is an upside, you know, Yes, uh, there is these technologies. And, and and so it's not all negative, but um, I think it needs to be more balanced. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm seeing uh, we still got a lot of questions here, so I, we won't get to all of them, um, but maybe we just uh, handle a few more here. Um, and I want to be respectful of everyone's time as well. Um, there's one question that's come up two different ways um, from Penny Livingston, uh, a great uh, designer. Are you familiar with one of the first GMO experiments uh, with Pseudonia syringa, of course. Of where they course. modified uh, the shape of the bacteria to keep no. frost from collecting no. on strawberry they, plants they, in California? No, that's not what they did. Okay. They modified, they took away a gene. They took a gene out. And this strain was no longer ice nucleation active. It was done at the university by, by people who I went to the graduate school with. Okay. I mean, I know this story intimately. Um, and um, they took it out and they said, if we spray it on strawberry or potato plants, it was potato plants. If we spray it on potato plants, then the potato plants will no longer, will super cool and they won't freeze and we can. And then they also did it on, on uh, strawberries, but, but potatoes was the real concern because that's the economically important crop. And um, the public went bonkers. Uh, they said, and why did they get upset? Because, uh, Jeremy Rifkin, who was a lawyer, who has fought for many really good causes, uh, protecting workers' rights and everything, he came out and he said, with zero proof, because no one had worked on this subject, that if we use this bacterium, we won't have any more rain. Okay? He had zero, because no one had talked about it then. It's, and he has zero proof, and so people went just bonkers and they blocked the laboratories of the researchers and it became an extremely a contentious situation. Today, the US for transgenic organisms, that's the place to go. They don't care, right? That's where you can get it done or you can go to China. Europe, we don't, we refuse to do all this research, okay? Or to do the, the field experiment. So the tables have turned. But yes, yeah, Pseudomonas stringy, that's its big claim to fame by having a gene cut out, which was scientifically I must say, even though I have great admiration for the colleagues who did it, scientifically not so smart because it's one of a many, many strains. The spectrum is very diverse. They could have just used naturally non-ice nucleation active variants of this bacterium. It was only one of a few. And to add one to the hundreds, thousands of different strains that are very diverse in the environment, but we didn't know about all that diversity, was not going to change the balance. So both sides were sort of had the wrong approach. Jeremy Rifkin was completely off and the scientists didn't need to make a, a, a negative a strain that didn't have the gene. They could have just taken a natural one to do this experiment. But yes, I do know the story. So that, yeah, that definitely <laughs> um, helped clear that up. 
Um, I think probably just our last question here, and then we'll we'll give you some time for any closing thoughts. Um, if you see one that speaks to you, Cindy, I, otherwise I have one picked out. Um, Go ahead, please. Uh, so uh, I wonder if you're aware of the work of Dr. Jo Gerald Pollack at the University of Washington. Um, he's he's looking at exclusion zone water, uh, structured water. He calls it fourth phase water. It's not really its own phase, but it's substantially different. It's this heavily organized, similar to ice form of liquid water that forms in between. Yeah, uh, I've heard of it. I've heard of it. Water. I've heard of it. Yes, I've heard of it, but I, I don't master the subject. So what's the question about it? Uh, and the question is, um, how or is there any relation between the for this uh, nature of water, the formation of ice in the clouds, and the varying temperatures? Uh, required for that okay. ice nucleation. I, I don't know that that phase of water um, is something that exists in nature spontaneously or if it's something that they discovered in the laboratory under very particular conditions of atmospheric pressure and temperature. I don't know that, okay? So, um, and if it's something that can persist in water that has impurities in it. So all water in nature has impurities in it. I mean, when I say impurities, other things other than water. So I don't know any of that. Or it's just a transitory phase between liquid and, 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 and solid water. So I, I can't really speak to that. That it hasn't really come yeah. up on the register for in all my interactions with physicists. So Yeah. Yeah, because I know he's uh, just recently been looking into how, how the properties of water at this state may have impacts on cloud formation. And so I think that's the interest. Yeah, here. I, I, um, I, I don't, I don't know that works, so I can't speak to it. Yeah. Yeah. I think awesome. uh, one of the questions that would have been fun, maybe I'll, I'll leave this up to Cindy if she wants to answer that. It's, it's the role that uh, fun, fungi plays in you know, creating bio, bio aerosols and micronuclei. Yeah, well, fungi are, are a huge component in the atmosphere. There's only a few who've been demonstrated to be ice nucleation active, and they're not very abundant compared to Pseudomonas stringy. I mean, if you're going to go hunting the ice nucleators, you always come up with Pseudomonas stringy, and then you might come up with the other ones. Okay, so um, so th it's they're different, and they're they're. Their aerodynamic properties, they, I don't know, they tend to be heavy. They have a little bit different properties, but they, they can have a role, but they're just, personally, I mean, I maybe I'm biased, but I mean, I've spent a long time hunting for these organisms or watching other people hunt for them. If you look in the clouds and the, and the atmosphere, this is what you find, Pseudomonas stringly, dominantly, whereas the other ones are more rare. Oh, nice for the question. Everybody, I know there's so many unanswered questions, but the good news is the discussion is going to go on. It's uh, <laughs> we're going to post the link is going to be on the wire stars okay. community again for everybody. It's totally free. You can ask more questions there. The replay is going to be there. The the uh, chat is going to be there. So thank you everybody for joining. I think at the peak we had 350 people join live. That's amazing for a science webinar. Really? You know, sometimes okay. there's only. Well, like, I'm just like I'm really yeah. humbled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's so great. I think there's so much interest in this, and you saw it. Like people want to know how do we impact rainfall, how do we impact our ecosystems, and this is a really great answer to so many questions. And yeah, so let's uh, here's let's one. Connect. Someone says, "What about the mist just above the forest? Isn't that mushrooms?" No, it's mostly the the volatile organic compounds. Okay, mm. it's not much. It's a, it's a volatile organic compound. That's cloud condensation nuclei. Okay, that missed. Yeah. Cool. Sorry. Thank you, Cindy. This has been wonderful. You, you scratched yeah. my science itch. <laughs> yeah. And Carl, I feel like we didn't give you a lot of time to talk. Is there anything you'd like to add about all of this? Uh, I just like love the idea that we all interconnect with everything. I mean, it's kind of a, a, a deep, ancient Buddhist concept of interbeing with everything. And if we can internalize that, I think, you know, that really helps uh, the planet. Um, you know, everything we do matters and has some effect. Uh, it, we're, not, we're not singular actors here. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. So I was really intrigued about, I think we have a lot of 
things in common that we didn't, you know, oddly we had, you know, the, our, the discussions between the two of us, especially trying to put together some music and, and, and knowing nothing about each other. It was a, as a, I said, this person, I will, I would get along with you had I met you under other circumstances. You know what I mean? Yeah. I said, yeah, here's a friend. And send, so, me your, send me your lyrics, Cindy. I'll put it to music. <laughs> and then you don't have to deal with copyright. Yeah, yeah, I know it's like crazy. Well, my lyrics usually are generally stuck to existing melodies, but I mean, I still have tons of them that I want to produce. But uh, yeah, okay. Um, so, I, I may I, let me say one comment. In all of the uh, comments I see, uh, I just want to remind people that there's no one-shot solution. And for every solution you can come up with, there's going to be a negative. There's going to be some downside to it. Okay, there's going to be some downside to it, um, and that um, the decisions about what to do generally are compromises. That that's why we work together, the different stakeholders and issues. That's why you work together to find out what do we want to live like, what kind of society do, do we want, and we accept the downsides and we accept the upsides. And somewhere there's an optimal. Um, and there's just no one shot deal. And please trust science. I know there's a lot of lots of uh, negative um, information today about about science and scientists that some of it's merited. OK, some scientists are just there for fame and glory. Um, but the scientific method itself is extremely useful and can protect you from a bad insurance salesman. Okay. Even not even just, you know, it can help you buy good brands of coffee and protect you from bad service uh, insurance salesman, as well as advance some of these, these concepts, because it's a method to maintain objectivity. And um, that's really, really important. So I thank you for the opportunity really to, 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 to talk about this and to talk about a subject that I obviously am passionate about. <laughs> no, we're grateful. Uh, we you appreciate on. you. Yeah, we appreciate you so much coming on and sharing all your information and knowledge. And I really appreciate and love how it comes back to relationship. Because with any of these things, there's the observations that we can make. But if we're not acting in accordance with relationship with one another, we're going to get deviated from where we're trying to go pretty easily. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that yeah. observation and living in that relationship with others in that connection, it's one of the maybe more woo-woo aspects, but it's important even just uh, from a very rigorous scientific manner, if we actually want to move somewhere positive, we need to be accepting and interpreting all of that feedback. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we're human beings, eh? So, I mean, even as uh, objective scientists, we do have emotions and 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 needs social connection needs and those, yeah. So, all that is important. So, okay, well, it was great to interact with you guys, and I, I give out a couple hellos if you're still there. There was Claudia Menyniz who 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 wrote a little thing from Colorado. She's someone that could probably help you out. She's a good scientist, and uh, maybe my cousin Shelly. Hello, Michelle. So. <laughs> That's great. We'll Whatever. hope to see some folks there. on there. There's so, there's so many great other folks that join us, you know, like Gloria Flora, Nick Pertulis, Judith Schwartz. They're, these are all amazing water heroes. And, and you yeah, all I would love are to water meet some of you. Yeah. For doing this work. So I think we'll close it out now. But thanks, everybody. Again, you're all going to get the replay. And again, uh, hop on to Water Stories Community for a post webinar discussion there. And uh, okay. hope you all have some Off great, to the future. great week. <laughs> been a great ride water. okay thank, thank you very oh and, but, uh, what? workshop of gender sing for everyone in the bay area there well that's filled but that we can anyone can uh join the gender sing uh talk which is going to be on march 30th so uh, just for every anyone who's in the bay who wants to join all right okay. take care everybody thank you so much cindy thank, thank you, you carl guys. thank you everybody thank you for joining thank all the participants who stayed the 142 people that are still hanging in there okay <laughs> <laughs> bye bye you got it ciao everybody bye cheers everybody wonderful